Well, it is a high day in Zion. Amen? So thankful to see each of you that are here today worshiping with us at the Grand Bay Hilltop Church. And we're also grateful for all of our friends that are watching online. Or I know 3ABN is carrying our program today. We thank them for that, as well as um, AFTV, and it's um, on Facebook. It's always encouraging as I travel to hear the different stories of people that are tuning in. A quick little uh, story. I was playing racquetball this week, and one of my friends, they know I'm a pastor, and he said, you know, Doug, he says, I'm on an online men's Bible study, and during our online Bible study, the Bible study leader, who's in another state, said, I want you guys to watch a video. You know where this is going. So he said they started playing a video, and when they got done, he said, uh, I play racquetball with that guy. I've known him for about 15 years. You do? Would he talk to our Zoom group? (laughs) And so it is just so neat to see the way God is using media to touch people's lives. We just hear these wonderful stories all the time. And so I want to thank you for putting up with all the production stuff that as a local church family, uh, you need to endure. But God is reaching people, and it's very encouraging. And this weekend, we're especially excited to be hosting this Amazing Facts Youth Conference. And it's good to look out there and see all the young faces. Uh, Some of you are thinking, maybe you'd like to trade places with me. I'd trade places with you in a moment if I could. (laughs) My father used to say, youth is wasted on the young. And I think James Dobson said, just about the time your face clears up, your mind gets fuzzy. And so, oh boy, I wish I could go back and be uh, about 16 years old, knowing what I know now. Of course, 16, that was a tough time, but you know, maybe 20. <laughs> but I'd like, to, I'd like to share some things with you today in uh, our weekend series dealing with Trials and Triumph, the power of the story. And we're going to be looking at several biblical vignette stories that tell us about both trials, some tragedy, and ultimately triumph. And we're going to talk to you about how you can write a story of triumph. I'd like to begin by having you join me in the Bible, turn in the Word of God to the book of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, a passage that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, where it tells about this rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. See, Jesus had just got done blessing the children, and... A wealthy young man was watching from a distance, and he just felt moved by the the teachings and the character of Jesus. And as Jesus was preparing to go down the road, he ran after him. And he got down on his knees, and he said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And Christ said, why do you call me good? None is good but one, and that is God. Keep the commandments. He said, which ones? And Jesus began to recite for him the Ten Commandments that deal with man's relationship with his fellow man. And he thought, what Jewish boy doesn't know the Ten Commandments? He said, all these I've kept from my youth even till now. What do I lack? And Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell what you have, give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And take up your cross And follow me. One thing. What is that one thing that you lack? Well, evidently, this uh, young man, he weighed the cost of sacrificing the riches. Said, how can I turn away from that? Everybody wants money. Everyone wants to be successful and wealthy. And I'm there. You want me to sacrifice all of that? And then take up the cross. That means like self-denial and crucifixion. I don't know if I can do that and give it to the poor. And it says, he went away sad for he had great possessions. It always is amazing to me that he went away rich. He still had his money and he went away sad. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Quick story. I'm not going to share much about myself, but I I will share with you um, something that many of you know, is that my father was very wealthy. And several times in my life, 
And my dad didn't say, you know, Doug, I'm just going to give you an allowance. When I left home, I mean, I've dug in ditches, I've picked oranges, I've done auto mechanics, I've built houses, uh, I've had like jobs like people. He said, do you work for me? That's different. But he said, if you're out on your own, you're making your, your bed, you sleep in it. And I've heard a little voice say to me, boy, life could be a lot easier if I just go work for dad. But after I accepted Jesus, I just remember there wasn't a lot of happiness in the home. You can have a lot of money and not be happy. Now, I'm, there's probably some people that are wealthy and happy too because they've got Jesus. But I knew for me that if I, if I went away from what God had called me to do, I'd be miserable. And even when my father died, everybody was battling over the estate and the foundation. And, uh, you know, my dad set up a foundation. I checked this week, $350 million in the foundation. And when he died, I could have hung around Florida and been involved in the foundation. It would be fun to give away money. By the way, he doesn't give money away to religious organizations. Some people think that uh, somehow my family or my father had something to do with the Word Center. Not a penny. Don't, that's not at all true. It came from our Heavenly Father. <laughs> it came from people. Nothing from any organization. Nothing from any denomination. It was God's people that did this. The Lord did this. But, you know, I heard a little voice say, yeah, you could stay in Florida and life would be easy. And I thought, but, you know, God's called me to preach. And that is so much more important. And I don't regret it. You know, a lot of, a lot of my friends that are there in Miami Beach and others we knew growing up very wealthy, their lives often ended in tragedy. And many of them, they're gone now. Their lifestyles, and, um, or they're miserable. And I've got joy. This man's story, it's an example of um, a trial and a tragedy. He went through that test and he failed. Now, what is that one thing? What's that great commandment? There's really only one thing for each of us. Someone said to the Lord, what is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? He quoted Moses. Moses says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Mentions three things there. All your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. So there's really one thing there, all. Love the Lord with all. How do you do that? By the way, the very fact that Jesus says, and God says through Moses, that we should love him with all implies that some love him, but not with all, you can love him partially. And I think that would be the case of many who are Christians. It's they love the Lord, but not with all. Jesus said, uh, kingdom of God is like a man that finds a treasure in the field and he goes and sells all that he has. Or he finds a pearl of great price and he sells all that he has to get that pearl, to get that treasure. And friends, Jesus is worth everything. He's offering us everything. He gave everything that we might be saved. You know, fortunately, there's a happy example in the Bible of triumph. Jesus found a tax collector who also had a pile of money. And he goes up and he says to Matthew, follow me. Maybe he shared with Matthew that story of accounting. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? That's a good accounting question. Matthew thought about that, and he said, that's not a very good deal. It'd be worth more to have eternal life. And the Bible tells us, you can read this in Luke chapter 5, 27. After these things, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the office. And he said, follow me. So he left all, and he rose up, and he followed him. When he called Peter, James, John, and Andrew, it says they forsook their nets and they went to follow him. Now, some people think that you can accept Jesus and just put a little Jesus into your existing plan. That's not how it works for the real Christian. For the real Christian, it is a total commitment. It is total consecration. I love the story about the chicken and the pig. 
They were so thankful that the farmer fed them so well. The chicken suggested one day, we ought to do something nice for the farmer. And the pig said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, why don't we make him a bacon and eggs breakfast? <laughs> and the pig thought about it and he said, well, for you, it's a donation. For me, that would be total consecration. <laughs> and that's really what it is. It's a total commitment that we make to the Lord. You look in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what are the trials that we deal with that we must triumph over? It's not a physical war in some country. It's not really the idea that you might be captured and tortured for your faith. The trials that we deal with are everyday trials. And your triumph in the little everyday trials is going to mean the ultimate overcoming and victory. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That means the life of Jesus. The life is in the blood. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Here's a trial. It says, love not the world or the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, notice here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. You get three things there. Jesus was tempted in three principal areas. Eve fell in three principal areas. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. So we're all being tried every day. We're being tested every day. The triumph is he that does the will of God abides forever. So I'd like to talk to you about the three principal areas. I'm going to simplify it. Where we're tried and where we must triumph. It's simply your body, your mind, and your heart. Keep it simple. Your body, your mind, and your heart. Now, I hope you'll forgive me if I get a little bit specific today, but I've got this one shot this morning to try to uh, share with you what I think very important priorities are. Love God with your body, all of your body. You must consecrate your body to God. The Bible tells us in Romans, Paul says, I beseech you, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's like putting your body on the altar, saying, all that I am, it belongs to you. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified, become a castaway. You need to consecrate your body to God. Now, you know, that would involve getting proper exercise. It would involve getting adequate rest. I know when I was young, I'd stay up for 24 hours and then I could sleep for 24 hours. I don't think I was that temperate. I'm literally, we, I would sometimes, I'd sleep for a whole day practically. And I'd tell myself, well, I'm growing, so I need to rest. Teenagers, now, boy, if I could sleep 24 hours. Take care of your body. Exercise. The Bible tells us whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do all to the glory of God. Be careful what you eat and what you drink. You know, you should eat at mealtime. Don't be snacking all the time. Don't be eating junk food because your mind doesn't work well. Now, before I get to mind and heart, you realize it's important for you to take care of your body because if your body is not well, you do not understand with your mind and it's your mind that then influences the heart affections. I spent a lot of time witnessing to drunk people. When I first came to the Lord, I had friends that were using drugs or they were drinking and I'd witness to them and under the influence, they'd blubber and sob and say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I'm tired. This dog, I, yes, I do. And then they wake up the next morning, they forget the whole conversation. I was wasting my time. Now, there may be exceptions to that, but man, they needed a clear head to understand what the Holy Spirit was saying to them. And a lot of young people in this generation don't hear the voice of God's Spirit because their minds are so rattled with what they're eating and what they're drinking. And there's kids that they don't ever drink water. They're drinking Rockstar and Monster and Red Bull and, and they're going to the hospital and their hearts are racing. And you gotta take care of your body. 
You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 2 says, And put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. I like the visual there. It's that important that we're careful what we eat and drink. You know, it's scary, but it is a fact. Two-thirds of U.S. adults are overweight. One of those two-thirds are uh, categorized as obese. A lot of us are killing ourselves. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Serious consequences. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We are to care for our body temples. Take care of your body, friends. Philippians 3.19 says, Whose end is destruction, their God is their belly. There's more different things people can eat and drink today than any other time in history. And Jesus says that uh, we ought to pray that God gives us our daily bread. We keep it simple. Water to drink. I don't mean just eat bread and water, but you understand what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you eat or drink due to the glory of God, that means it's possible to not eat or drink to the glory of God. Some people that are on a seafood diet, they see food and they eat it. Take care of your body. Eat the right thing. Woe to you, O land, when your prince is a child. Blessed are you, O land, when they eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Eat the right things at the right time in the right quantity. Get your exercise. Get your rest. Get some fresh air. Uh, good work is healthy. And then ultimately it says, Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known to all men. Stay away from any drugs unless the doctor's prescribing it. Get some aerobic exercise. The only aerobic exercise some kids get is... Oh, wait. There's a carpal tunnel when they're 13 years old and they're texting. Amen? Take care of your body. Now, while we're talking about the body, um, you want to be careful what you eat. I said, eat at the right times. I have an old friend that gave me some good advice. He was in his 90s, and he was out still running his rototiller. His name was Art Reed. And I said, Art, you're in such good shape for your age. And he said, well, yes, I run out of steam earlier than I used to. He said, but I learned when I was a young man. He said, wake up when you're still a little bit sleepy. Stop eating when you're still a little bit hungry. He said, stop talking when you still have something left to say. That's good. You ought to write that down. That is some good advice for life. You don't want to be controlled by the flesh. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, if we are controlled by the flesh, we will die. We want to be controlled by the spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life. We've all got bodies. We all have desires in the bodies. They should not rule you. You should rule it. Amen? Esau sold his birthright for a pot of beans. Some people do it for a donut. You need to say, I am God's. Care for your body. Now, while I'm talking about the body, you know I can't address a room full of young people without talking about sex. Now, depending on your age, at some point you're going to realize that God created you for, among other things, with the capacity to procreate. And you will begin to feel certain urges and desires and drives that, it's interesting how girls, uh, you know, when they're young, they think boys are yucky. And then the boys get to be teenagers, they discover girls, and the girls then get to be teenagers, they discover they've been discovered. And it just turns their world upside down as they go through that transition for a few years. And the challenge is today with media, so much of what young people are learning about sex and the beauty of sex that God created, they're learning a corrupted, perverted idea because of pornography and the internet. And many kids first exposed at eight years of age. And you've got to make up your mind that uh, 
the devil can wreck your thinking with that kind of uh, behavior, friends. Stay away from that stuff. Do not look. You've got to do what Joseph did. You know, Joseph is one of the heroes in our story here. Genesis 20, 39, rather, verse 10. You remember Joseph? Handsome young man working in the house of Potiphar. And his master's wife, he was a general, so she may have been a pretty trophy wife. We don't know. But she cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. That can be understood clear enough. He said, no. And he kept avoiding her and staying away from her. The Bible tells us, so as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Joseph is a wonderful example of triumph with a young person in this area of purity, friends. Yes, you can be pure. Amen? 2 Timothy 2, 2, 2. Chapter 2, verse 22. You can remember that. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. Flee youthful lusts. Finally, Potiphar's wife lay hold of Joseph. She got a hold of him. And he had to wrestle free and run from her. Flee temptation. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. This isn't just a message for young people. I'm thankful for the example of Job in the Bible. Job, chapter 31. He says, I have made, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I behold or gaze upon a young woman? He had made a covenant with his eyes. That's what I've done. I'm married. I made a covenant with Karen. But I am a healthy man, even at my age. And if I go to the health club, and not every young lady at the health club dresses appropriately, fortunately, I just go through the front door into the racquetball room. But you'll see things. You don't have to go to the health club, do you? You can drive down the street. And when you see things and you see that it is an inappropriate picture or it's something suggestive, I say, I don't want to look at that. I actually, I'll tell myself that. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to think about that. And if I ever catch my mind going the wrong way, I stop it right now because I say, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Amen. You make up your mind and you stay out of a lot of trouble just by saying no. Don't let the devil tempt you. When you're sitting there at the computer and something pops up and you're thinking, I ought to click on that. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, you don't want to click on that. Amen? Amen. You've got to make a covenant. God is calling us to purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. You can't spend all your time looking at that other stuff and then see God face to face. We need to be pure. Sexual purity. Not only do we need to love God with our bodies, here's the next part. We need to love God with our minds. And take care of your body, your, your health is good, and uh, then you want to be able to think clearly. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And then when Jesus quotes Moses, he throws in an extra category. Did you ever notice that? Moses simply says, love the Lord with your heart, with your, mind, with your uh, strength, and um, with your soul. Jesus says, and your mind. Now, clearly, the mind must be something different than the soul and the heart because Jesus spells it out. He throws it in as something different. You want to love God with your intellect, with your brain. I'm a Christian not because of a warm feeling. You know, when uh, I studied with the Mormons before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I studied with Jehovah's Witness and Pentecostals and lots of different people, and and my Mormon friends would say, I'd say, well, you know, how do you know that this is true? You're saying Joseph Smith's writings are true. They said, well, you'll get a warm burning in your bosom. I said, I don't want a burning in my bosom. I want it to make sense in my head. I'm from New York City. I, it, it doesn't, there are a lot of con artists out there. So the devil can give me a burning in my bosom. Pizza can give me a burning in my bosom. I said, I want to know, does this make sense? Is it biblical? People think that you've got intellectuals and then you've got Christians. You've got people that are uh, philosophers and scientists and they're educated and they're professors and then you've got people who believe the Bible. I don't buy that for one minute. I think the Bible is a very intelligent, logical book. Jesus was the most brilliant person who ever lived. People who came, they reported back, they'd been sent to arrest him. They came back and they said, how come you didn't bring him? They said, 
Never man spake like this man. You know who they told that to? The professors. Jesus was brilliant. Christianity requires you to use your head. I believe in creation, not just because the Bible says it. I believe in it because it's scientific. The idea that organization and design comes from chaos without intelligence or a designer is illogical to me. You should know what you believe and be able to share what you believe. Worship him with your mind. Study the Bible. Be ready to give people an answer. And that doesn't just say, well, just the Bible says it. Reason with them. God tells us, come now, let us reason together. The Almighty says, I gave you a noodle. I want you to use it. Because he doesn't call it a noodle. But it's, he wants you to use your mind. Christianity, the Bible, the truth should appeal to the intellect. It should give you a good foundation. So when you're tempted, you not only say, um, you know, I know I shouldn't do this. You may with your heart be thinking, well, I want to do this, but your brain is saying that, that is a bad decision because the consequences of that decision are going to end poorly. You know what I'm saying? God wants us to use our brains. I heard someone had a, an ad posted on Craigslist. It had said, Encyclopedia Britannica, entire volume for sale. We have the internet now. We don't need it. And my wife knows everything anyway. <laughs> you know, Bible tells us God knows what you think about. You won't have success with your body until you give him your mind. Psychologists say that there are about 10,000 thoughts that go through the human mind one day. I don't know how they analyze that. I don't know how you can do that like counting sheep to say there's a thought and there's another one, there's another one. Because I know I have way more than 10,000 thoughts that go through my mind in any day. Psalm 94 verse 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man's that they are vanity. Amos 4 verse 13, for behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. God knows what you're thinking. And if I'm ever drifting in my thinking, I always pray the Holy Spirit will bring it to my attention so I can redirect. And you are the sum total of what you think. That kind of defines your character. Some people are bitter because they allow themselves to dwell upon hurts and pains and slights, and they're just bitter and angry all the time. Uh, you need to think on those things that are good. Of course, that's that uh, verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Now, when we love God with all of our mind, that means we need to consciously choose to say, I want to feed my mind good things. I'm always studying. Um, principally, the Word of God. Every day I read the Bible. Um, it's the most magnificent book. I thought it was very interesting that when Henry Stanley went to Africa looking for David Livingston, uh, he took off an agnostic. He didn't believe in God. And he had this parade of caravan of porters carrying all this gear because it took him over a year traping through Africa to find him. And he started with like 300 books. And I felt sorry for his servants that were carrying his books through the jungle. But as they began to abandon him and they died from malaria and all this misfortune, finally he had to decide what books to throw away. He was left with one book. God worked that out where Stanley was reading that one book. God was speaking to him through the Bible. He couldn't bring himself to throw away the Bible. And then he met David Livingston. And he said, after seeing that man live out the Christian life, he says, here is this man out in the middle of Africa, surrounded by paganism and threats of death and disease. And he said, why is he doing it? And he saw Jesus in his life. He overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. He saw that testimony. He read the Bible. And Stanley was converted as a result of that. You want to love the Lord with your mind. Feed your mind those things that are good. If you're watching goofy television, if you're watching silly YouTubes and TikTok and Instagrams, and you're filling your mind with 
mental junk food, you are not loving the Lord with all of your mind. Now, I know everybody's, I could just see a bunch of you right now, look right and left and then hang your heads. I've seen some stuff on YouTube and people have sent me TikToks and I look both ways and I look at it, you know. Don't become preoccupied with that stuff because I know young people, they get addicted to it. And it's real easy. They spend all their time, what's the latest crazy thing that people are sending around? Well, have you seen this one? It went viral. What is it? It's, you know, somebody shooting themselves out of a cannon. It just, it's, there's no spiritually redeeming value in this stuff. So why do you want to fill your mind with foolishness? The devil doesn't care what your distraction is. It doesn't necessarily to be, need to be terribly evil. As long as he can keep your eyes away from Jesus and the things that really matter. And the devil has a whole generation that is just distracted with frivolous foolishness on the internet. And I just see the kids, you walk by and there's 50 of them, they're all looking at their phones. They'll be 12 feet away from each other, they're texting each other. Instead of walking over and saying something, they'll text everybody. And uh, they'll say, oh, 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 they'll laugh and say, I'm going to forward this one. Oh, 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 and they're all like, yeah, what are they looking at? It's a poodle in a ballerina skirt or something. You know? And you just, oh, it's not necessarily evil, but yeah, if this, the devil's got us just wasting our minds. You know, one of my heroes of history. Now, he was a Christian. He was a deist for a long time. And he later converted back to Christianity as Benjamin Franklin. And you can read his autobiography and see that. But he left home 17 years old. And he had a hungry mind. And he could have filled his mind with all kinds of foolishness. But he decided to learn all he could. And he learned about science. He learned about electricity. He learned about practical things. He invented bifocal glasses. He developed a post office. He invented a musical instrument. He learned to play the guitar. I mean, you, you stand back and look at all the different fields, and he's what you call a polymath. He was sort of just a genius in so many areas because he thought, I've got one life to live. I want, not to mention his involvement in politics and the freedom you now enjoy, and he's on every $100 bill. And he was very practical. Once he made enough money, he said, I don't need to work on making money anymore. He put that aside. He lived off what he made. And then he continued to study. He, wanted to, he was, had a hungry mind. He wanted to know all he could about as much as he could. If I could go back in time, I would spend a lot more time reading and learning. And whatever you learn in this life, you're taking with you to the next life. Take care of your mind. Don't waste your mind. God knows our thoughts. Isaiah chapter 26, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Some of you, you're in turmoil, you're anxious, you're worried. Stay your mind on God and you'll have peace. What kind of peace? Perfect peace. 1 Timothy 4, 12. Timothy's an example of a triumph in this area. Let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers. Let them see your story. In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come. Give attention to reading, Paul is saying study, to exhortation and doctrine, study again. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate, He's saying think about these things. Take heed to yourself in the doctrine. Those are intellectual words. Continue in them. Notice, for in doing this, you will save yourself and those who hear you. By using your head and feeding your mind, taking care of your body, you're going to be able to reach other people. So you're not just learning for your own entertainment. You're learning so that you can share. Guard your mind. Guard what goes into your mind. Guard the avenues of your soul. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity and obedience to Christ. You want Jesus to guide your thinking. You want your thoughts captive to Christ and his spirit. Amen? Now, you know, the prodigal son, when did he come home? When he started thinking. After spending time in the pig pen, it says he came to himself. And he began to reason with himself. And he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? This is not logical. I need to do something about that. He got up, and he went home. Romans 12, 2, not only does it say present your bodies in Romans 12, verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How do we transform? By the renewing of your, what? Your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're reading through the word of God, and it transforms your mind. Now we want to serve God with all of our body, consecrate our body, present it a living sacrifice. We want to give him our brains, our minds, our intellect. It's talking about your cerebral thinking, being analytical, which is really distinct from the next part, your heart. That's your affections, your core affections you want to give to the Lord. Now, why do we want to serve the Lord? I heard Brother Aaron sharing this in, in the last presentation. We love him because what? He first loved us. When we see his love for us, it's not just an intellectual thing, it's an affection. Your hearts are touched. It should move your heart. You now you can, you can see a lot of tragedy and, and uh, you can think crime is terrible. Um, you can read the news, and you can bother you intellectually, but when someone breaks into your house, then it's emotional. It's a little different. When you're out of job, it's a recession. When I'm out of a job, it's a depression. God doesn't just want our intellect. He wants our hearts. Why is this important? Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart. If you say, Pastor Doug, what if I don't love Jesus? Don't worry, he can give you a new heart. Jesus was not only a carpenter, he was a heart surgeon. He does transplants. And he can give you a new heart. That's why David prayed, Lord, create within me a new heart and put a right spirit. So if you say, Pastor Doug, I just, I haven't felt it. That's okay. He can give you a new heart. He can change your affections. He can put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The things you once loved, you'll hate. The things you once hated, you'll love. You can become a new creature. All old things are passed away. All things are made new. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. For the Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? On the heart. When the Holy Spirit came on the king, when he was anointed, it says a new heart was given to him. And God can give us new hearts. Matter of fact, you need to have, it's not, you know, this is not optional, friends. Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, the Bible calls it being born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We need to love him all our hearts. People worry about how am I going to survive the time of trouble? How am I going to make it through the last days? At what point will I give up when I'm being tortured and they're putting bamboo shoots under my fingernails or I'm being burnt with a hot iron? How will I be able to endure? You don't have to worry about that. If you love the Lord with all of your heart, you're home free. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ready and willing to go to the fiery furnace because they love the Lord with all their hearts. They also love the Lord with all of their bodies. They would not defile themselves with the king's food. Amen. They love the Lord with all of their minds. And so they told the king, we don't need to even take time to answer this question. So we got examples in the Bible of triumph over body. People like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, they would not be defiled with the Babylonian food. We've got examples of people who triumphed in their minds, like Matthew and the prodigal son and others. And there's a lot of examples of people who triumphed in their hearts. Peter did not know his own heart. He said, oh, though all men forsake thee, I'll not forsake thee. Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith does not fail. 
he thought, oh, though all men forsake thee, I'll not forsake thee. The Lord said before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me. He thought he knew. But, uh, and Peter was right to a point because when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter actually had a little sword. And he pulled out his sword and he went to kill the man who was tying up Jesus and he was not a very good soldier. He was a fisherman, so instead he just got his ear. And Jesus healed the man's ear and said, Peter, put away your sword. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And then they carried off Jesus and Peter then followed at a distance. Well, you get into trouble following Jesus from a distance. He thought he loved Jesus with all his heart. He did love Jesus, but not all his heart because he followed at a distance. You know what happens when you follow Jesus from a distance? You end up denying him. Peter always was worried about what the crowd thought. When the crowd was around Jesus, he wanted to be there when Jesus was multiplying the bread and he wanted to be the spokesman for Jesus and Peter was always the first one to say anything. And he even compared himself to his friends. He said, though all of these forsake you, I'll not forsake you. And when he was there outside the trial, warming himself at the fire, he loved Jesus, but he didn't want to get too close. So Peter was hanging around with the enemies of Christ and he wasn't ready to confess that he was a Christian. You ever have that problem? You're surrounded with people that you know are very um, unappreciative of Christianity. They uh, don't have a high opinion of Christians. And so you don't want to be unliked. I mean, let's face it, we all like to be liked, right? And so your friends are telling dirty jokes and you'll kind of chuckle because you don't want them to think that, uh, you know, you're not part of the group. And you try and melt in. You start sacrificing your convictions. You're in places you shouldn't be. They're talking about things you shouldn't be talking about. And you love Jesus, but what's the crowd going to think if I stand up and say, you know, I don't want to be part of this. You got to let me out of the car. Or uh, you walk away. Did I lose my microphone? I guess it's time for the closing hymn. No, then we're back. <laughs> I don't know what I did. You're my witness. I'm just standing here preaching. <laughs> So Peter, by hanging around the crowd that was against Jesus, and they started saying, oh, you're one of his followers. No, who, I don't know who you're talking about. Never saw him before. And a little later, someone else said, I, you got a Galilean accent. You were one of them. I, I don't know. He ends up swearing and cursing, denying Jesus. And look how quickly it happened. From that very, it wasn't even 24 hours from him being at a prayer meeting with Jesus testifying with his friends then he's denying that he ever knew Jesus he loved the Lord but not with all his heart but then right after he denied Jesus the third time he turned back towards the judgment hall and they had either a valance or pillars or something he could see what was going on inside and he saw a soldier strike Jesus on the face and Jesus looked up and he wasn't even interested in the pain Jesus turned and he looked at Peter Jesus had a look of compassion. He said, Peter, you know, I still love you. I told you this was going to happen. You don't know your own heart. And he saw Jesus being taken off to be beaten and ultimately crucified. And it broke Peter's heart. The Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. It wasn't just logical. It was emotional. When he saw the love of God, Peter loved him because he first loved Peter. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even in the midst of his denying Christ, Jesus said, I still love you. And when you're surrounded with your friends and they're making fun of Christians, you're acting like you don't know Jesus, he still loves you. He's dying on the cross for you. And then Peter went out wet bitterly and he was a different man. Did he then love the Lord with all his heart? He did. And later when they said, Peter, you better not preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Do what you want to do. And they threw him in jail. They whipped him. He would not stop telling the story because his heart had changed. So how do we come to where we love the Lord with all of his heart? We love him because he first loved us. If you want to love the Lord with all of your heart, you need to spend time looking at his love for you. That's the thing the devil does not want. He does not want you to see how much God loves you because it's transformational. 
He doesn't want you to spend time talking to Jesus. He doesn't want you to spend time reading his word. And he certainly doesn't want you to spend time sharing your faith. And we talked about loving God with our bodies, loving God with our hearts, loving God with our minds, and then you want to share God with your life. Amen? Once you have committed your, your body and your mind and your heart to Jesus, then you want to live it out in your life. You want to be a witness for him. After Peter heard this, he was transformed. You can read in 1 Peter, share God with your life. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know the story about the, um, the demoniac when he was healed. You read this in Mark chapter 5. It's in Luke chapter 8. He's the most lost man in the Bible. The devil's got him lock, stock, and barrel. Running around naked up in the mountains, eating out of uh, where the pigs eat and, and living in a tomb. And he comes to Jesus in that terrible condition. Jesus casts out the devils and he sets him free. The Bible says he's now sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And he was so thankful with his heart he brought his body to Jesus. Jesus cleansed his mind, and he was so thankful. He said, Lord, I want to be with you wherever you go. Jesus said, well, let's start by doing this. If you really love me, go back to your home and tell them what great things God has done for you. He didn't just go home. The Bible says he went, and he broadcast through all the cities in the region what great things Jesus has done for him. He had to tell everybody. Friends, if you go from being dead to being alive, if you go from being sick to being well, if you go from being lost to being found, that's good news. You want to tell people. When you believe that Jesus has saved you, you are so thankful you just can't keep it to yourself. I remember reading there in uh, Luke chapter 5, this man full of leprosy comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you want to, you can make me whole. Jesus says, I want to. He touches him and he heals him. And his leprosy, he's full of leprosy, but now the man is completely cleansed. And then Jesus tells him the impossible. He says, don't tell anybody about this. Not that, you know, the Lord didn't want the good news. It's just that he knew it was going to rouse opposition early. He said, just go show yourself to the priests according to the law of Moses. Make the offering for cleansing from leprosy. But oh, no, that man, he could not keep it to himself. It says he went everywhere telling what Jesus had done for him. Amen? You know, we started out talking about the rich young ruler. You can read about that in Mark chapter 10. Jesus said, follow me. Rich man. Jesus, you read in that same passage, says Jesus looking at him, loved him. So go forsake everything and follow me. Now Jesus didn't tell everybody to forsake everything and follow him. He did tell the apostles that. Do you know that? This man was given the same invitation that was given to Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew. We don't know what his name was. Could have been Wilbur. It's not a biblical name, but it stands out. You could be reading your Bible, and it would say Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Wilbur. He could have been an apostle. That's right. It says looking on him, he loved him. But the man loved money more. Like Balaam and Judas had ended so sadly. They loved the things of the world more. But you know, you go to the end of Mark chapter 10, and it says there's a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And he hears this commotion in Jericho. And he says, what is it? And they said, it's the teacher from Nazareth, Jesus. Jesus, I, I, I've heard that he can heal even blind people. Jesus, and as he heard him getting closer, he used his sonar. And when he could tell that Jesus was approaching, he began to shout at the top of his lungs and say, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And they told Bartimaeus, Should be quiet, you're making a spectacle. People are trying to talk to him. You're a poor, dirty beggar. You're cursed of God. Be quiet. He would not listen to the crowd. He called out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. By the way, calling him Son of David means he believed he was the Messiah. Jesus heard him the first time he called. But he let him keep calling. Jesus hears you the first time you pray. Don't stop praying. 
Finally, Jesus stopped the procession and said, bring him to me. And they said to Bartimaeus, rise. Good news, he's calling you, come to him. And I love this part. This poor blind beggar casting aside his garment, that's all he had. Casting aside his garment, he came to Jesus. Uh, the garment of a beggar is probably not very clean because you don't know where all the spots are, do you? Casting aside his filthy rags, he came to Jesus. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Well, it's self-evident. He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He says, go your way. He says, you can go. Your faith has made you whole because you came to me believing your eyes are going to be open. And the Bible tells us that, oh no, once his eyes opened, the first thing he saw was Jesus' face. He saw that face of love and it says he followed him down the road. The beggar was willing to give everything. The rich man was not. The rich man went away sad. The beggar followed him poor and rejoicing. Now Jesus is following all of us. He has a story that he wants you to share. You know, Christ, in the wilderness, Jesus shared all with us. The devil tempted him in three areas of temptation. His body, his mind, and his heart. Jesus said no to the devil in all those areas, meaning you can have victory in all of those areas. And when you see his love for you, you should love him. You know, what kind of world would we have if the young people today would give all? If we would sacrifice, if we would trust Jesus, cast the world away and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. There's a quote I'd like to share with you. It's from the book Education, page 271. There's no line of work in which it is possible for the youth to receive greater benefit than the work of God. All who engage in ministry are God's helping hand. With such an army of workers, our youth, rightly trained, might furnish how, so, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the end come, the end of suffering and sorrow and sin. Oh, that's the desire of my heart, to see programs like this spread like wildfire, that there'd be a revival among the young people that would say, I want to give God my body. I want to give my mind. I want to give my heart. I want to take up my cross, and I'm going to follow Jesus because that's the only way to have triumph in the end. You could write that story with your life if you make that decision. You could have lives of being an overcomer and being victorious. How many of you would like that? You know, I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. We're going to sing our closing song about victory in Jesus. I love this song. It's a great song. I wish it was in our hymnal. Victory in Jesus. We're going to invite you to stand as we sing.